All right, ladies and gentlemen, sit back, relax. The show is about to begin. Today, I am going to attempt to describe to you my dating life via literature. Horrifying. <laughs> of course, I will only be showing the bad side, and I do just want to make it clear, I really do not bear any malice to any of these people, and only one of these dates really keeps me up awake at night mortified, and I will let you be the judge of which one that is. I've had this video idea stewing in the back of my mind for a very long time, and I'm finally ready. I think it's going to be a nice catharsis for all of us. We're all friends here. So essentially what's going to happen, I'm going to tell you about a really awful date I've been on, and then I'm going to recommend to you a piece of literature based on that date. We are going to start with like the least bad date I've been on. That's just kind of like a fond memory now, and then slowly ramp it up to utter catastrophe. Buckle up, let's, let's just get started. I'm ready. I'm ready. I've had a few drinks of tea. <laughs> oh, I'm just looking at this list. Oh god. All right, so the first date I'm gonna tell you about is one that I just, I honestly look back and I smile. It's like a fond memory now. It's something that I'm just like, oh, that was just kind of nice and silly. Um, it was the first date I'd ever been on, but in fact, we're gonna call it the anti-date because it wasn't really a date. Nothing bad really happened, but in terms of a date that you would want to be taken on, I don't think this is really how you would realistically like it to go in your adult life. At the time, I was like 13 or 14, and it was a double date. It had to be a double date, otherwise I wasn't allowed to go. So essentially, me, my friend, and my date and her date we are going to see Spider-Man, the first Andrew Garfield Spider-Man coming out in theaters. We get there, we get out of the car, we walk into the theater, and the two boys are standing there. Let's call them, let's call them Draco and Zebediah, okay? We walk in, they bought us our tickets. That was honestly really sweet. But they come up to us and they just kind of, they're like talking to each other as they walk up to us and they're walking up to us very hard, trying not to look at us. And essentially they just kind of reach out the ticket to us and then kind of run away a little bit. Anyway, it's finally time for the movie. My friend and I cannot find these boys anywhere. Eventually we see them ahead of us. They're like close together, talking, laughing, having the time of their lives, absolutely not paying us any attention. I don't think they've even said hi. If I didn't know any better, I would have thought maybe they were on the date themselves together. Anyway, we finally get into the theater, we walk to our seats, and I think it's at that point that they realize they actually have to sit next to us and engage with us and say something. I think they're both just absolutely crumbling with anxiety and nerves and I really do feel for them but I think they just like look at each other <laughs> and at that point they realize that they have to be separated for each other right because it's going to be Zebediah, me, my friend, what's his name? Draco. We take our seats and not a word, I kid you not, not a word is spoken for the entirety of the movie. We get up, we walk out of the theater, someone checks his phone and he's like oh my, my mom's here to pick us up, we're, go we're gonna go now see you guys at school and they literally walk out together. Did we get looped in into going on a date with them? That was their date? Um, but honestly, like that memory is just, it's just really nice because like it's that instance of when you're young, you have no idea what you're doing and you kind of get to a moment of like going on a date, which just seems so scary and you realize you're just totally not ready for it, totally not mature enough to handle it and you just absolutely panic freak out. So the book I'm going to recommend to you is called First Love by Turgenev. This is a Russian classic and it's just, it starts off kind of like this date. It's very sweet. We have this boy who is falling in love with his neighbor. She's extremely beautiful, extremely mysterious. She has a whole bunch of suitors. They all go over to her house every night um, and he's slowly becoming more and more infatuated with her. This story is also being told from the perspective of him as a grown man, looking back at his experience of first love and realizing maybe it wasn't all that it was cracked up to be, maybe those feelings don't translate to the same passion or intensity in the present moment in which they did in the past. And what starts off as like a very sweet, serene, innocent experience suddenly becomes something of intense magnitude in your elderly life when you're looking back kind of at the beginnings of your first budding, blossoming sensations of love or attraction or whatever, and it actually takes quite a darker turn, which obviously my date didn't take, thankfully. Yeah, I would highly recommend this book. I gave it five stars. It was it was one of the best, one of my best books of last year, actually, so that is that one. All right, let's take it up one level more. Okay, so here goes. We're chilling at Frank's house. Let's call him Frank. We've only been dating for about a month maybe not even and it's getting to that point where i'm like okay maybe i should you know get a ride home soon or something um but then his family and him are like oh no no i have i have hockey practice tonight and you should totally come so we all get in his car 
with his parents who I've spoken to maybe once or twice before, never been left alone with them. I could have gone home, but all of a sudden I'm stuck somewhere and guys, I don't even have a book with me. I'm like, oh crap, I have to sit here. His aunt is there too, never met his aunt. And I'm like, okay, well, how, how long are you gonna be? I think it was only an hour and a half, but it felt like eternity. It felt endless. I felt like I was never gonna leave that hockey arena. To top it all off, we get in, his team starts to come out, and they're all wearing obviously the same beige uniform. We are nowhere near that point in our relationship where I know him well enough or even have a good enough idea of like the intricacies of what he looks like to be able to distinguish him from the rest of his team. They all look the exact same. I'm watching 15 year old boys sloppily pass pucks to each other. This isn't even a competitive team. It's it's just the skill level is really lacking. Get me out on the ice. His mom's like, oh, oh, they're gonna play a game. We're gonna be able to see Frank play. And I'm like, oh, oh, cool, good. But they don't even split up their team once they've got a game going into different colors. Like they just, they just know. And so I have, I have no idea. I'm like trying to watch this game. I think I have my eyes on the boy I'm dating and then 10 minutes pass and I realize I've been looking at the wrong guy. His mom leans over and she's like, oh, Frank is just playing so hard for you. He never tries this much. He's really playing much better than he usually does. I wonder why. And I'm like, well, good for Frank. Can I tell which one is Frank? No. So for this date, I was really hesitating between the two, but I think we've got to go with Samuel Beckett. And it's never really good when Beckett describes your love life. I don't think any of us really want that to translate into dates we go on, but I was hesitating between Endgame or waiting for Gatto, his two plays, but we're currently reading um, Endgame in class right now, and so I just, I've just been thinking about it so much. I'm like, this applies perfectly. Endgame is a play about people who are waiting and suffering. They're trapped inside a house. They can't leave. Outside has been decimated, whether it's by environmental or nuclear catastrophe. No one knows. They want to leave each other so badly. They want to get out of the house, but they can't. Every time they go to leave, they're like, I, I can't leave. I have to go on. I have to go on suffering. I must keep suffering. Waiting for Gatto <laughs> is also about waiting for a dude who never shows up. And it's just like this endless, repetitive cycle of sitting or standing, waiting, Sometimes you're bored, sometimes you're in agony, but at every moment you just want to leave. Seriously, this play is very upsetting. There is so much suffering here. Witnessing as well, I guess that that's another tie-in. That's another tie-in too, because I'm having to watch this endless hockey game, or so it appears to me. Um, and of course, this this is a play um, concerned with the meta theater in which the players, the, the actors, the characters know they are actors um, and the audience is implicated and is kind of um, a character a little bit, I guess you could say, in the play. The characters know they're being watched by an audience who is witnessing them suffer. Yeah, I just felt like Endgame kind of perfectly encapsulated that moment. Next up, we kind of have a short embarrassing moment, which I just always love. It's like a little jab that you're going to think about for the rest of your life. So it's Christmas. It's Christmas. I am still 15. I'm still 15. Um, I have no money. I'm in a relationship of like two months. Um, I don't have any money. I have yet to have my first job. I'm in my second year of high school. And obviously it's that time of year where you buy gifts for your significant other. The problem was there was no communication about like price range in my mind i'm thinking very practical i'm thinking neither of us have any money we have not been dating for very long i get my mom to drive me to the dollar store i know that he likes star wars i know that everyone has to like chocolate and candy who doesn't like chocolate and candy and i know that his favorite animal is a pig his favorite animal's pigs so I'm like, great, I have three things to go on. So what do I get him? I combine the Star Wars and candy thing and I get him a Pez stick that has the head of Darth Vader. I thought that was pretty ingenious. It combines candy and his favorite movie. What's not to like? And then I go down like the Chotsky trinket aisle and what do I see but one of those little like trinkets that have the little solar panel on them to make it move. And what is it? It's a pig. Better yet, it's a flying pig a flying pig that moves in the sun. He can put it in his window, he can stare at it all day while he eats his Darth Vader Pez. I've nailed it, I've got this in the bag. So Christmas night, I go to his house, we go up to his room, we're like, okay, let's exchange, let's exchange presents, Merry Christmas. He's like, okay, I want you to open yours first. And I'm like, great, it's a huge box. And I'm like, oh, what have you gotten me? What's in the box? So I open the box and what is in it, but like this huge, expensive, big, the big set of Victoria's Secret perfume bottle, lotion, 
I think there was shampoo, conditioner, just like everything. All the Victoria's Secret, like knick-knacky, oh, oh, hand cream, all of that. The very expensive, like pink Victoria's Secret, um, whatever it was of that year. Next to that, there is a huge, extremely quality looking teddy bear that has a bow. It has hearts on its feet. It's an expensive teddy bear. I also got the most gorgeous, exquisite hair clip that I still have to this day. I still wear it because it's just that phenomenal. I'm like doing the math. I'm trying to do the math so fast in my mind and like calculate what this man's gift is coming out to because I know it like puts mine at, in the in the ground. My, my gift is in the ground. It's in the grave. It, it's dead. At this point, I've, I've been slowly like inching the box behind me to see if I can convince him that I just forgot his gift at home. I was so embarrassed. I was like, thank you so much. You know what? Maybe we can open your gift another time. And he's like, no, no, Emma, I want to see your gift. What'd you get me? This one was to it actually, no, it wasn't even totally my bad. We just didn't communicate at all about what the expectation was because I clearly had very low expectations or whatever you want to call it and you know he was shooting for the stars um he was very gracious about it he's like oh that's so cute um he did in fact put it on his window and he he started eating the pez right away the book i'm going to recommend for this situation is great expectations by charles dickens because there were great expectations and there was definitely a great letdown um this is my favorite dickens book i think it's phenomenal it's about pip um and via an anonymous benefactor he is suddenly let into this world of high english society he is uh sent to london where he is kind of trained in becoming a gentleman and all of a sudden he has to contend with all of like his kind of um, lower countryside values I guess put up against this high city socialite world of which he really has no knowledge of no experience um dealing with this world and he's suddenly thrust in it and you know just said to be like okay here you go and that's kind of how I felt because <laughs> I was just not on the same line, you know, I think I spent maybe $10 on the gift, whereas like I calculated his out to be like easily probably over $100. I just think this is phenomenal. Um, Dickens writing is gorgeous. I truly, truly think like if you're scared of Dickens at all, don't be. Great Expectations is such a good place to start. It's so welcoming. It's so funny. And it's just, oh, it's my favorite Dickens um, that I've read as of yet. So that is Great Expectations. All right, what's next? Oh, oh good. <laughs> All right, let's flash forward a few years. It is my 17th birthday. I think it's probably my 17th birthday. And my boyfriend and his friends, and they're also my friends, are like, don't worry, we're gonna we're gonna take you out somewhere. We're gonna plan something for you. And I'm like, okay, great. I'm, I'm, that sounds great to me. Let's go for it. I'm excited. My birthday is in late July. And for some reason it is always destined to, like there's destined to be a heat wave and a huge thunderstorm on my birthday. Um, I can't tell you the amount of birthdays I've had where I inevitably spend it with a migraine or with heat stroke. And what you're going to notice with a lot of these dates is that a lot of them are really no one's fault but my own body's, um, which has apparently a lot of problems that interfere with my love life. Anyway, the morning of my birthday dawns. It's hot as hell. It's like 30 degrees, humidex of like 35. I get a text from my boyfriend and he's like, okay, just so you know, you're going to want to wear very heavy pants, maybe two layers, like probably a turtleneck or something, maybe put another layer under there and probably some shoes you don't really care about. And I'm like, oh dear lord, it's paintball, isn't it? Dear God, it's paintball. Just a little poll. Do I look like the kind of girl who's into paintball? I used to be, actually. I did used to be a fan of paintball. Once, when I went, when I was, I think, 11, I'm like, you know what? We're, we're gonna go. I'm sure it'll be a fine time. I'll just, I'll deal with it. I'm wearing these atrociously ugly, heavy, thick cargo pants, like Kim Possible pants, but like thick and warm. I've got a normal long sleeve on and then I've got a very fuzzy turtleneck that goes up to cover and protect my neck from the, the paintballs. <sighs> I'm also wearing socks that like go up to my knee under my pants as well to protect from extra bru bruising. I bruise very easily. We get there. I'm already feeling like I'm going to pass out. Like the car is just, sweat is coming down. We get to the paintball place. There's really not a lot of people there and I'm like, okay, cool. Maybe it'll just be fun with, with me and my friends. We buy our stuff like the mask, the gun, um, what else do you have to wear? I don't know. The goggles, I guess I already said that. It seems like there are a lot of materials not really being used up, right? And I'm like, okay, great. That probably means there's not a lot of people going to be in, in our group, in our fight, in whatever you want to call it. We get down to the 
command center. The reason why there were so many goggles and guns and masks not taken is because there's about like 15 of the most hardcore looking scary teenage boys that I've ever seen. And of course, they have all come equipped with their own goggles, their own gun, their own armor, their own chest plates. They've done this a million times and they're all in the mindset that they are in fact in a Call of Duty game, ready to fire at anyone who comes their way. I'm immediately terrified. The heat stroke is starting to set in. I can feel the migraine building up behind my eyes because of the pressure and the coming storm. And all of <laughs> And I'm like, I'm gonna die. This is my birthday where I'm gonna die. This group of macho looking boys who are clearly overcompensating for something are gonna do me in. So we get in there. <sighs> Just like the, the adrenaline and the the screams of these boys who are like calling out like code names for like i don't know positions or whatever they're doing i literally just flop on my belly start crawling i'm like trying to get into the cool grass because at this point i'm feeling woozy on top of that you're wearing like the goggle and then the thing that kind of goes up and covers your nose i can't breathe my mask is fogging up i'm just in immense pain on the ground and my friends are like come on come on we gotta get to the checkpoint i'm this close to tears i'm like i need an advil right this very second it was just a wasted experience on me and on top of that a wasted experience that caused me so much so much pain and i think afterwards they kind of recognized like what they had just put me through and they were like whose idea was it to take emma emma paintballing i get home after that I've got heat stroke, I've got a migraine, I've got bruises coming out of the wazoo, and I basically just collapse on my bed and pass out in a puddle of my own jewel. Happy birthday to me. Clearly, the book I have to recommend, or the play, is Julius Caesar, um, because I really feel like my friends did me in. I was like Caesar, going to the forum, thinking I was going to be celebrated. It's my birthday. I'm going to be out here having a good time. And what happens? I get stabbed. I get betrayed. I'm betrayed by my friends. And they run their knives into me. They honestly thought it was for the best, much as the people in here think that assassinating Caesar is for the best. This is one of my favorite Shakespeare plays. This is the really beautiful Pan Macmillan edition. I love these. This book, uh, this play, when I read it, it just gave me chills. I think if I had to pick a Shakespeare play to see performed, it would be Julius Caesar. Um, it would 100% be Julius Caesar. Like, the lines in here are just so stirring. Like, they make you want to get out there and, and do something. Like, it really just brings you into the political atmosphere um, of Rome during the reign of Caesar. And it was just phenomenal. Like, you can see all these tabs I have highlighted. Just the beauty of the language. Um, it was gorgeous. It was so gorgeous. And on top of that, it does teach you a pretty good history of what was going down during Caesar's reign. So... <laughs> That's that one. Um, I will definitely always remember that as like the birthday where I got Caesared. The next one is just very sad, but I'm gonna tell you about it anyway. <laughs> I'm 16. I'm really starting like from the beginning of my, my bad day life so that if I want to make more of these videos, if you guys find them entertaining, um, we can we can work our way up from there. Or maybe should, to be fair, I should do a, a best date one to balance it out because we're just really highlighting the bad here. This day, I was so excited for. This is one of the dates I have been looking forward to the most all year. And we are going on a school field trip to Canada's Wonderland. I'd never been previously to Canada's Wonderland, which is a huge amusement park. I'd never been on a proper roller coaster. I just remember being like so excited, so looking forward to this day for months. Just having the best, most romantic, date filled time at this amusement park with my boyfriend let's call him norbert a bunch of people are coming from my school to go to canada's wonderland but it's super chill you can basically form groups with whoever you want and then you just you're sent on your way around the park have a great day and be back at the bus by this hour first problem arises once again has to do with just my own being so we get on the school bus it's another very hot day we all know the stench of school buses we all know the motion sickness that can sometimes occur canada's wonderland is near toronto which is about two hours away so we're going to be on the school bus for two hours on the highway no brakes no bathroom we're just we're just going all the way there so naturally what happens is that i both have immense anxiety about traveling and also motion sickness once we get on the bus i just get violently car sick we're sitting in like i think the first seat in the bus and i'm just like closing my eyes doing my breathing just trying to like 
just trying to come back down to normal. Meanwhile, Norbert's chilling next to me, reading a book on his phone, having the time of his life, oblivious. We're about an hour and a half into our journey when I feel, I feel it coming and I know it's unstoppable. I know there's nothing I can do about it. Luckily, I'm a smart gal and I've brought a dog bag with me. I brought a little tiny dog bag. So what do I do? Very stealthily, <laughs> I, lean, <laughs> I lean over like into the seat and I retch into the bag. I vomited and I like turn around. I am so quiet. I've become so skilled at hiding my suffering. No one notices, not even Norbert, although that might say more about him than it does about my skills. Anyway, I like tie the bag and I'm just sitting there with a little bag of vomit. He looks over at me and he's like, you look really pale. Are you okay? And I'm like, no, Norbert, I just vomited. And he's like, oh my gosh, where? He's very nice after that. We finally get to Canada's Wonderland. Although the odor has kind of started to penetrate and waft through the school bus, people are giving each other weird looks. So I'm ready to sprint off the bus and find the nearest garbage can to chuck my, my bag of vomit in, essentially. I'm feeling extremely weak, extremely ill. I'm still just trying to breathe. We pull into the parking lot and all of a sudden I hear a voice from behind us going, Norbert, Norbert. And my stomach what is left of my stomach since i didn't even eat breakfast just kind of sinks into the bottom of my feet it just like falls to the floor it plummets because that voice is the voice of let's call her gertrude who i know that norbert had a huge thing for before i was ever on the scene um and still does and i'm not sure how Gertrude cannot be aware of it because they talk all the time. And so Norbert gets up, leaves me, goes back there to talk to her. I need food, I need water, I need to get rid of this bag of vomit. He's like, oh, hey, hey, Emma, um, that was Gertrude. He's like, yeah, um, she's wondering, uh, she doesn't really have a group for the day. She was just kind of wondering if it would be okay uh, for her to tag along with us for the day. I like look up at him, shaking, pale, so weak. And somehow in that moment, he has managed to make me feel so much worse than I already physically did. How How is that possible? Because I know exactly what the day is gonna turn into if she tags along with us. He's like, well, I can't really tell her no. And of course, because I have less of a backbone than the most spineless invertebrate, I'm like, you know what? Fine, sure, she can come along. And I think you know what happens. I think you know. I think you know what happens. I think you can see the pain in my eyes. There's probably not a pain left there because I've kind of gotten over it. The day... What can I say even about it? The day that I was so looking forward to, like a, just a nice, just a nice, fun filled kind of bonding experience at the amusement park, going on like scary rides together, doing obnoxious couple stuff, just was hijacked completely. The whole day took a huge different turn and suddenly I found myself somehow third wheeling my own relationship. If you've ever been in that kind of situation, whether it's a romantic relationship or just a friendship or family or something like that, you know the, you know the feeling, of the alienation, the betrayal. You can physically feel your nerves in pain because of like the emotional turmoil. I literally just spent the whole day watching them have a great time with each other, essentially. I don't even get applauded for being a trooper, vomiting my guts out, and then going and enjoying like an eight-hour day at an exhausting amusement park, going on roller coasters and stuff, um, which I just thought was a little rude. Not a good day. For this one, I'm going to recommend A Dowry of Blood by S.T. Gibson. This one's kind of a more dramatic recommendation for the actual situation at hand, but this is a retelling of Dracula's Brides, in which we follow Constanta. She is a human. She's turned into a vampire. Empire. She becomes Dracula's uh, bride and eventually we just kind of fall into a toxic relationship. Dracula starts to bring in more and more consorts. Um, he brings in another woman specifically to make her jealous and it's just this very tangled web of deceit, abuse, manipulation. Um, there's a lot of scenes where Constanta just has to watch someone she loves, although she kind of knows that she shouldn't, fall in love with someone else. That was my amusement park date, guys. I know. This, this book is, is brilliant. The writing is gorgeous. The prose is just to die for. Like, it's so lyrical. It's amazing. Like, it's just lush and she really, really captures the feeling of, like, this immortal being suffering endlessly in this toxic relationship and, like, the, the toxicity of a relationship um, in that it goes on for, for far longer than it should because it's so hard to break that cycle. This was just fabulous fabulous highly recommend all right it only gets worse from there <laughs> this next one i take full responsibility for as being 100 completely my bad 
I was the one fully, fully in the wrong here. Um, so let's flash forward again. I'm in university now. It's my first year of university. And I'm at this library with this guy I really like. I really like him. He's really cute. He's really smart. He's really sweet. He's really funny. I like him a lot. We're not technically dating, but we know very well that it's a date. There's a lot of flirtation, flirting, flirting going on. We kind of know where it's headed. We study together all the time and it's just our thing. We're hanging out. We study well together as well, which is a great bonus because then you can get work done with someone you really enjoy being around. So we're in the library. <laughs> Sorry, it just hurts thinking about <laughs> it still embarrasses me thinking about it. I constantly get <laughs> flashbacked to this moment where I messed up so hard. We are on the second floor of the library at my university. It's exam season. The library is packed. We normally avoid second floor because it is the rowdiest. It is the most packed. It's the one where you can eat, you can drink, you can be loud. It's not a quiet place. And so everyone essentially just goes there to hang out and kind of do work but it's where we're forced to find a table. So we sit down, we both have our laptops out, we're both working. And that's kind of when the first sign of catastrophe arises because I feel my throat kind of getting a little parched and I don't have a water bottle conveniently. He has a water bottle. It, it, it's, it's, sitting, it's sitting right in front of me. And I'm like, oh, hey, um, can I have a drink of your water? Do you, mind if I, do you mind if I have a drink of your water? And he's like, yeah, sure, go ahead. You know that sense when you finally share, like you, cut, you drink out of the same glass as someone you like, it was kind of that that silly little moment so i'm like okay cool so i unscrew the top because i'm like oh don't worry i'm not gonna drink out of you know where you drink I'll, I'll just drink out of the the cap and then all of a sudden the knowledge of how any normal human being drinks liquid leaves my body it's gone i'm like he's watching me i see other people watching me this is like a tiny little pivotal moment in this relationship i'm drinking from his water bottle and I don't know how to drink. It finally happened, very ungraceful. It kind of dribbles down. That's fine. Not the cute moment I was envisioning. It gets worse. I put, okay, let me illustrate this. So the cap is undone. I have the cap, right? I put it on the table. I take the drink and then I somehow pick it back up and I'm like trying to do something like cool. I don't know why I thought it was the time to do water bottle tricks. I really don't. As I go to put the cap back on, he's sitting like right here in front of me, like where you are. I somehow miss like getting it in and it kind of goes at an angle. And then all of a sudden, all over his laptop, all, all over his laptop everywhere it's on his notes it literally spilled onto his keyboard it's it's raining down onto his lap onto his pants actually so <laughs> and it's loud right like it makes a noise the water bottle like slams on the table extremely loudly all of a sudden everyone in the second floor because it's an open concept library is staring at me and the mess I've just made of this man's poor laptop. Like there is an obscene amount of liquid on the keyboard, on the screen, on the assignment he was working on and on him. I have never wanted, I've never wanted to just evaporate more than I think I have in that moment. <laughs> I'm like, I'm convinced that convinced that I've ruined his laptop. I've I've broken his laptop. I've destroyed his assignment and I've got water all over him and everyone is staring at us. We're both too very shy. Do not want to be ever in the spotlight at all. Like, please don't look at me. We do not want to be the center of attention. Suddenly, hundreds of people are staring at us and like the mess we've created in the library, which in itself is like a no. You do not spill water in a library. <sighs> Of course, there's nothing around to clean up the mess with. There's nothing around. The only bathroom is on the first floor and all I can keep saying is, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. I'm like a broken record that can't stop saying, I'm so sorry. Run out the door, down the stairs, and there's a cafe on the first floor. So I go to the cafe and like, I just essentially rob their napkin station. Like they're staring at me. I don't care. I'm grabbing fistfuls and fistfuls of napkins. I run up five more flights of stairs to get back to him. I'm like out of breath. Everyone is staring at my face, tomato, cherry, red. It was just, oh God, <sighs> the cringe, the cringe. It just hurts. It physically <laughs> hurts to think about. Anyway, it turns out his laptop was completely fine. I honestly don't know how it survived. 
I don't know how it survived that catastrophe. And he wanted to see me again afterwards. So I guess, I guess my stellar personality made up for my inability to close water bottles. For this one, I'm going to recommend The Thief by Fumunori Nakamura. This is about a pickpocket. And of course, the pickpocket's goal is not to be seen, not to be in the spotlight, to avoid recognition and just go about his job um, as he would. This is a very dark book as well. Eventually, our protagonist gets looped into this plot that he really does not know like the severity of or the consequences of. And this could kind of out his whole identity and also starts to spiral into something that he never anticipated. This book is so great. It's so dark, but as well, like... It's those moments of connection and recognition with someone else that really startle him. Um, he thinks, I'm not sure what he thinks. I think he thinks he might mess something up, um, which, you know, I did mess up catastrophically um, if he comes into community with someone else. But it was just so well done, so devastating. It's a bit slow at parts. It's also a very short book. And yeah, I just feel like I got so much out of it and the ending, oh. And now we have our final two dates, which occurred at the same place with the same person, and they are definitely the worst ones on this list, so buckle up. Good lord. I'm in Quebec City. I'm there with my boyfriend and his family because it is the Festival d'été, which is a music festival in Quebec City that takes place during the summer. It's like a week-long thing, so we're there for about four days. The first day we get there, we are set to see the Foo Fighters. I'm gonna be honest, I've never listened to a Foo Fighters song. I don't think I still ever have to this day. Like, I have no- I've heard of them, have no concept of their music, and don't really care. But I'm like, you know what? Yeah, it's, it's what's on tonight. Let's just go. However, I check the weather, because I'm once again a smart girl, and there's a severe thunderstorm warning. He's like, you know what? No, it's okay. It's gonna be fine. It's gonna be fine. And if it, if it storms or whatever, like, don't, don't worry about it. It's no big deal. It's really no big deal. It's just a thunderstorm. So much of this night could have been prevented if someone- and by someone, I mean- my boyfriend would have just listened to me. So essentially we set off, we go, we have to park miles away because Quebec City is packed. It's jam packed. So many people are coming. Rolling, The Rolling Stones are performing in a few days, which will be relevant later, but the city is jam packed. Every street is lined up with cars. And so we park about a 45 to 50 minute walk away from um, the stadium, which is located on the very famous battlegrounds, which are flat, by the way, extremely flat. This will also be important. Okay, so we walk and as soon as soon as I step out of that car, I can immediately feel that something is is off. You know when you get that feeling, um, it's something to do with like the pressure. You you kind of get that like animal instinct, primal knowledge that something is vaguely threatening. And what's vaguely threatening is the weather because I look at the sky. The sky has gone like dark, and I'm like, wow, that sky looks really menacing. Are you sure you wanna? walk 50 minutes there and then 50 minutes back he's like oh yeah oh yeah i'll be fine don't worry about it we're just gonna go it's gonna be a great time do not worry don't be scared we're fine so we get 20 minutes in and all of a sudden i just start hearing this very ominous rolling thunder we finally get there we scan our pass it's completely pitch black by now it started raining at this point thankfully we brought ponchos the ponchos are not gonna save us so we get up um, on this hill, it's like a, I guess, a flat, and then there's hill, and it's flat, and then it's hill of this, like, historic, historic battleground. Um, and we get there. It is so packed. There are so many people. I'm also on my period, which will also be relevant later, okay? You got, we're keeping it all for later. It's raining. I'm like, you know what? This is kind of fun. This is kind of fun. A concert in the rain. That's kind of fun. That's when the first lightning strike hits the field. I swear to God, like, very close to us, extremely close to us. And I'm like, did you see that? Like, we should go. And he's like, no, no, the storm's over there. Over there is like 50 yards away. The storm all of a sudden picks up so much lightning. I've never <laughs> seen this much lightning before in my life. All of a sudden, all the lessons you're taught in school about where not to be during a lightning storm go through my mind. And I realize I'm in all of them. Eventually the Foo Fighters are like, this is dangerous. We are going to stop please leave. All of a sudden, it's a mad stampede. The planes have turned to mud. It's just like a mudslide. We like frantically try to get out. I'm like literally scared that I'm going to be struck by lightning. I don't think I've ever been that close to being struck by lightning. Um, I wonder if there's like a video or picture of it. If there is, I'll try to insert it, but it was just like actually very extremely scary. Thankfully, we're off the flat ground now, so now it's just like a torrential downpour. So, Remember how I said I was on my period? The pad has inflated and I now look like I'm wearing a diaper. That is the least of my worries because... <laughs> 
pants. Oh god, because for those of you who don't know, the soft, plushy, nice part of the pad has a point where it stops and then it kind of goes into the plastic part, right? Which is part of the adhesive. Because it is so ballooned up, that plastic part has now become stiff and is digging into my inner thigh. With every step that I take, and we have a long freaking way to go, this thing is like slicing through. <laughs> slicing through my thigh like a hot knife through butter like it is excruciatingly painful blood starts dripping down my legs i am soaked <laughs> it was really a night i'm never gonna forget we get back to the hotel and i can't walk like i'm unable to walk to go up the stairs i'm walking like i've just come off of riding a horse for 10 days straight I like get into the hallway, I collapse, I'm like sobbing, I'm in so much pain. Blood is every <laughs> blood is everywhere. I'm like <laughs> I'm like soaked and I call my mom and I'm like, Mom, can you please come pick me up? And she's like, Emma, you are eight hours away. I cannot pick you up. What has happened? It was just so a series of unfortunate events really is what it was, but they all could have been prevented if if, if someone just took me seriously. So I have to recommend Cassandra by Crystal Wolf um, because Cassandra is a prophetess, but she is also cursed by Apollo that no one's ever gonna believe her. She foresees the future, but people don't listen to her. They're like, you're just, you're just wrong. She prophesies the Trojan War and people are like, Trojan War? What are you talking about? In this retelling though, Crystal Wolf just talks about the life of Cassandra what life was like for her. It's a really beautiful, extremely well-researched book, and this one also comes with like a couple essays um, about her experience and her trips to Greece writing this book, so I just, I really love this. This is such a smart, beautiful, scary book, um, and it's all about people, people not being listened to, but about her life um, and about how she's also more than that not being listened to this symbol if that makes sense so i would highly recommend i thought this was great um super duper good i would love to reread it because i read it quite a number of years ago now so that was my time that was my time at the foo fighters concert the next book i'm going to recommend is the uh inferno by dante why well funny you should ask because a few days later we went to the rolling stones concert and by went i mean i was pretty much i was pretty much coerced into going because rolling stones was conveniently Norbert's father's favorite band. I know the Rolling Stones are huge. I think I had heard, I only knew sympathy for the devil, honestly, I'm not gonna lie. And I had no care in the world. I didn't care that it was the Rolling Stones because the only other person on the lineup that I wanted to see for the week that we were there was performing literally at the same time as the Rolling Stones. Edward Sharp and the Magnetic Zeros for anyone wondering, which some people clearly weren't. And I'm like, oh, like, I I know you don't really care about going to the Rolling Stones. I know it's just your dad's thing. Like, can we, could we please maybe go to the, the concert I want to go to? Um, and he's like, no, you know, it means so much to my dad if, if we were there. A Rolling Stones concert, as I learned, is like a huge event. People flew to Canada, to Quebec City from like England, from around the world to see them perform. The venue was way too small. I do not think there were any restrictions. We get in, the line is down the whole street. We get in and we are this close. There are thousands and thousands of people and you are pressed up so close to strangers like sardines to the point where you like, your chest becomes tight. It's difficult to breathe. Everyone is standing on your feet. I can't even see anything. I'm five foot two. Do you think I can see the stage? No, there's thousands of people in front of me. They're all pushing together. I started to get a panic attack. Like it was just honestly one of the worst. I just keep repeating, I am uncomfortable. Can we please go? Can you please take me out of here? I can't breathe. So eventually we have to wind our way out of this huge stadium. I'll like insert a picture over here because I'm sure someone took a picture. Definitely that place was filled well over capacity. As we're going out, there are so many ambulances coming in, so many medics coming in, so many people trying to save their friends who are like collapsing or people who are having panic attacks, people who can't breathe anymore. Being so close to people that like you couldn't, you couldn't exist, you couldn't breathe, like your org, it was just... Wow, it just gives me very panicked thinking about it. A lot of the punishments in here definitely remind me of a concert that has been filled way past the capacity that it should be. Um, I don't know why this took more of a serious turn, but this is one that I don't really look back on and laugh about because I'm like, this is a serious issue that people are clearly still dying to today when it's just, you do, oh God, it just makes me so angry. The Inferno, Dante's Inferno, spectacular. And I really like this edition because it came with illustrations too. Um, which were 
very complimentary, but I would highly recommend. And as well, it is a very suffocating, sad experience to wade through because you're just meeting people who are suffering in the pits of hell. On the bright side, as soon as we made it out, we did make it out okay. I started to breathe again normally. I did get to go to Edward Sharp and the Magnetic Zeros. And it was a great concert, not crowded, lots of room. I got to dance, I got to sing, and yes, I'm, I'm very happy I got to go to that concert, but man, the Rolling Stones thing, very scary, like just straight up so scary. Those are some pretty bad dates that I've been on. If anyone wants to take me on a good one, <laughs> here I am. Uh, thank you guys so much for watching. Maybe, maybe I'd even love to do another episode of this one with like your guys' bad dates. I would love to hear about them. I think that would be so funny and then give book recommendations on them as well so that something, um, something good can come out of them, some kind of fruition. So thank you so much for watching. Um, <laughs> this was so much fun. That was so fun just chatting to you guys about that. I felt like I was hanging out with a friend. So I will see you very soon. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you got some good recommendations or at least some good laughs. And yeah, until next time, I will see you so soon. Ciao.